Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at munitions and clothing production, railways and shipbuilding, and shipping and overseas trade. We hear now from Dr Christopher Phillips about the railways. My name is Dr Christopher Phillips. I'm the founding member of the First World War Network, an international society for postgraduate students and early career researchers that are interested in any aspect of First World War studies. My particular interests are in the railways and in transport infrastructure in general and its implications for warfare in the 20th century. What I want to talk about today is the railway network. In 1914, the railway industry in Great Britain was an employer of a huge number of people. Somewhere in the region of 600,000 male employees were in the railway industry before the First World War. And outside of the post office, railways were the biggest employers of people anywhere in the country. Railways have become an integral part of people's social and economic lives in the previous 30 to 40 years. Railways delivered goods from rural centres into urban markets. And because Britain was a huge exporter of goods, it took goods away from urban factories to the coast for export overseas. And it also, in the 20 or 30 years before the First World War, had started to play a very prominent role in commuting passenger traffic moving from suburban places where they were now living into the city centres where they were working. This meant that the railway station played a very central part in people's daily lives. The London and North Western was the largest employer in the railway industry in Britain before the First World War. It had a workforce of 70,000 people and annually it was carrying over 100 million passengers and 40 million tonnes of goods around the country. Before the war, there is a very prominent relationship between the army, the major railway companies and the government. This is something that is really fostered by a man called Henry Wilson. Wilson acted as the director of military operations at the war office. So his job was to ensure that the British army was prepared to fight should a war break out. Wilson realised that with various elements of the British army scattered all around the country, that the easiest way to move these men was going to be by railways. They were the only bulk carrier that was available that had the speed and the capacity to do this. In 1911, Wilson talked to the government and he convinced them that he needed to be able to work in very close cooperation with the railway to develop a scheme that would allow the British Expeditionary Force, the force earmarked for overseas fighting, to be concentrated as quickly as possible. This is a period in which the dominant military philosophy of the day is all about mobility, about speed, about manoeuvre. It's all about getting your troops to the battlefield to impose your will upon the enemy. If the British army is stuck in Britain and the fighting is taking place abroad, it isn't going to be of much value to its allies in the field. So from January 1911 onwards, and this is a process that carries on all the way down to July 1914, the very eve of war, Wilson is working with members of the railway industry. They're working in secret with officers within Wilson's directorate to create a mass of timetables that effectively tell every single unit earmarked for dispatch to the continent where it needs to be, when it needs to be there and what it needs to do when a war is declared. And the railway companies therefore knew exactly what time they needed to have a train with drivers and all of the carriages that were required for the troops and also for their equipment and horses which were a huge part of the armies in those days, to be ready to travel down to the coast where a steamer would be ready to take them across the channel. At the outbreak of war on the 4th of August 1914, the Railway Executive Committee, they immediately take control of the railway lines. When the decision is made on the 6th of August that four divisions of the British Expedition Force are going to be sent to France, it is through the Railway Executive Committee that the decision to move these troops is made. In the first fortnight after the mobilisation period, 334,000 troops are moved around Britain. This includes the dispatch of the British Expeditionary Force, which is originally around about 100,000 men. You've also got the calling up of all of the reservists, the volunteers, the territorial units to their home defence stations. You've also got all of the naval reservists moving up to Scapa Flow, where the Royal Navy is based, 
All of these movements are taking place in that two-week period. Remarkably, during that period, the vast majority of commuter trains still run. There is very little dislocation outside of the sort of area between London and Southampton, which is obviously full of military traffic as Southampton is the principal port used for the invocation of the expeditionary force. The vast majority of traffic actually runs as normal. What's also remarkable about this period is the number of horses that are being moved around. In the two years before the war, British landowners and farmers have undertaken a census of horses in the country, as there was some debate over whether there actually were enough horses in Britain to service what the army felt it was going to require at the start of the war. It turns out that there were by a substantial amount. Big landowners were given numbers of horses and dates and times and places to move those horses to after war had been declared. The rolling stock was made available to them by the railway companies. That meant that they were being moved down to the coast in exactly the same way that the men were. The relationship between the railway companies and the army and the government doesn't stop with the mobilisation of the troops. The railway companies become an integral part of Britain's war effort. In the Houses of Parliament in the first six months of 1915 alone, the Railway Executive Committee is being asked to take into account things like the movement of seed potatoes from Scotland down to the south of England for planting. They're also being asked whether the facilities that the railways make available for the horse racing season are going to be the same because war's broken out. And they're being asked if they can look into changes that have been made to export patterns of cotton from Manchester, which is normally sent by railway to Liverpool, put onto a ship and sent over to Ulster, where it's bleached and dyed in firms in Belfast. But with exports of cotton being restricted, those bleaching and dyeing firms in Belfast aren't getting the trade and are actually going out of business. All of these topics have a railway link. At the same time as they're being asked to look into all of these there is a war going on, and the railways are going to be central to this as well. And this starts in September 1914, where the War Office asks the Railway Executive Committee if it's possible for the railways workshops to provide 12,500 ambulance stretchers. These are required because the casualty figures that are coming back from the fighting in France are far higher than anybody anticipated. And the railways have got huge productive capacities. They have some of the biggest workshops in the country. Making locomotives, making carriages, making all of the wagons is a significant industry. And all of the big railway companies and many of the smaller ones have their own workshops, some of which employ five, 6,000 people. The Railway Executive Committee takes this request to the companies. They divvy it up between five or six different companies and they produce those stretches within a month. This starts off a productive relationship that lasts for the entirety of the war. So from late 1914 onwards, the railways are involved in the production of war-related manufactures. These aren't necessarily just shells and bombs and forgings for guns. It's also more mundane and everyday items that an army needs. Travelling kitchens, kettles, drinking cups and so on. The things that an army needs to keep morale up among the troops. By the end of the war, the list of products that are being produced in railway factories for the war effort runs to 121 pages. And the estimated cost of all of this is about £18 million. The railways face a major problem at this time. The amount of work that they're being asked to take on is growing. But the number of people that they have working for them is drastically decreasing. In the first few weeks of the war, around 27,000 people leave the railway industry. Reservists who had been in the army and had found employment in the railways after they'd left. Members of the territorial force, who are obviously called up when war is declared. Also volunteers who enlist in the new armies that Lord Kitchener is putting together. Railway start to ask the War Office for some exemptions There is an attempt to restrict the outflow of men from the railways, but it's not particularly successful. By the end of 1914, the London and North Western, which is the largest of the pre-war railway companies, has lost about 14 to 15% of its workforce. However, all of the companies are still competing to show who's making the biggest war effort. 
This is something that's taken up by the railway press. Periodically throughout 1915, so before conscription comes along, they're printing league tables of the numbers of men from each of the companies that have enlisted in the war effort. They're also publishing the proportions of the workforce of that company. So you can see that a small light railway line in Kent may only have 10 employees, but if five of them have signed up for the war effort, that's 50% of their workforce has disappeared. So you've got an industry which recognises the critical need for manpower, but it's also very happy to see its members moving into the armed forces, doing their bit. The obvious place to look for replacements is going to be female labour. Before the war, there are around about 13,000 women working in the railway industry, but they are entirely in menial and clerical roles, working in back office functions or predominantly things like sewing upholstery in railway carriages or doing laundry in railway hotels. When the men start to disappear, women do come into the railway industry in a significant number. But it is never enough to make up for the losses of manpower. In the war as a whole, the railway industry loses about 184,000 men. At its peak, there are 69,000 women within the industry. So there is a significant shortfall there in terms of numbers. There is also a significant shortfall in terms of the skill levels that these women possess. They haven't been working as carriage upholsterers or engine cleaners or certainly engine drivers. There is also a significant problem with staff turnover. Because far more opportunities are open to women during this period, if they don't like a job, they can move on to somewhere else. And this is a very big problem for the railway companies throughout the war. 69,000 women being employed by the railways is a peak figure achieved in September 1918. But far more women than that passed through the railway industry during the war. The production of munitions and other items within the railway workshops aren't the only contributions that the railway industry makes to the British war effort. There are 184,475 employees in the armed forces. The vast majority of these are fighting men in the infantry, in the artillery, in the Royal Navy. But around about 2,000 of those are managerial figures, administrative figures, clerks. What they have is expertise in organisation, which is something that a vast army, which the British Army becomes in the First World War, is desperately in need of. The most prominent example is a man called Eric Geddes. Before the war, he was the Deputy General Manager of the North Eastern Railway, a railway that employed around about 55,000 people. Geddes, over the course of the war, becomes almost a personal troubleshooter for David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who then becomes the Minister of Munitions when the Ministry is first set up. This is where the two men meet. Lloyd George interviews Geddes for a post at the Ministry of Munitions. He's impressed by what he sees, and he offers Geddes the position of Director General of Munitions Supply. What that job entails is not really that different to what Geddes is used to doing with the railways. It's coordinating production. It's coordinating the work of people who are employed in lots of different places. The North Eastern Railway has its headquarters in York, but it also has major stations in places like Newcastle. It runs trains as far as Leeds. It has a lot of presence on the northeast coast in places like Hartlepool. And Geddes has to coordinate the work of all of the people working in these different places. So when the government is setting up munitions factories across the country, it needs people who have experience of organising workforces that are in different places. Over the first six months that Geddes is employed with the Ministry of Munitions, the munitions output from the British factories that have been established is exponentially increased. So the shell scandal of May 1915, when we get to July 1916 and the Battle of the Somme, there is no shell scandal because the shells have been produced and they've been moved by the railways to where they are needed. This means that the British are able to fire a bombardment before the Battle of the Somme that is unprecedented in British military history. Over the course of eight days, they fire 1.7 million shells at the German lines. The Somme doesn't lead to the breakthrough that the British Army are hoping for, and it's realised both in London and at the Western Front that a far bigger effort is going to be required in 1917, and possibly even in 1918, if the war is going to be won by the Allies. 
What the battles of 1916 do, and I'm including here also the Battle of Verdun, which is fought by the French at the same time as the Somme, is it erodes the French transport network. Supplying these battles is a colossal effort. The French transport network, which has been hard at work since the outbreak of war, is on the point of collapse. And the French start to appeal to Britain for help. So from the winter of 1916 onwards, there is a real outflux of these British managerial figures to the Western Front to oversee the British transport effort. Geddes becomes the Director General of Transportation on the Western Front. This effectively makes him the fourth senior staff officer within the British Army. He is given the honorary rank of Major General. He is tasked with overseeing this creation of a transport provision behind the Western Front. It means reorganising the ports that are being used by the British force for all of their imports, not just from Britain, but from all over the world. It means developing a light railway network which can operate between the mainline railways and the artillery. In the spring of 1917, a mile a day of light railways are being built behind the Western Front by British and British Imperial troops who have been sent over to the Western Front specifically for the task. They are building these railways, in some cases, right up to the artillery guns that will be firing the shells that run along the lines. This means that when the British go into battle again at Passchendaele, 3rd Ypres, what they can fire is substantially larger than what they've been able to fire even a year before. In 1917, the British are able to fire over 3 million rounds before the Battle of 3rd Ypres actually begins. This is not just destructive firepower. It annihilates what's in front of it. This isn't just the German defences. It's also the road network, the railway network, everything that the army then needs in order to supply itself when it advances, which means that you have to repair it all before you can attack again, which slows down the speed with which you can attack. It allows the Germans time to recover. These are the problems that the British army is grappling with in the second half of the war. To supply this greatly expanded transport directorate, Geddes has to get a lot of supplies from the British railways because the production of a locomotive and locomotive wagons and rolling stock takes a long time. So places in America or Canada or Australia that would perhaps be able to produce these locomotives wouldn't be able to do so for a very long time. And these are stocks that are needed urgently over in France. The solution is to take engines and wagons and rolling stock from the British railways. Over the winter of 1916 and 1917, the General managers of the railway companies visit France and discuss with Sir Douglas Haig, the commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force, what he needs. They come back and they resolve to send, as soon as possible, 350 locomotives from the British railways over to France. By the end of the war, that figure has risen to over 600 locomotives. These are all taken out of service on the British railways in order to be used in France. To do this, the British railways have to economise. They can't run the same services that they've been able to run before the war. So they start to close stations at the beginning of 1917. To economise on coal, which is another vital resource, they start to slow down the speeds of express trains. They start to free up different parts of the timetable to allow skilled men to move across to France to contribute to the war effort. These closures affect both the largest and the smallest companies in Britain. The London and North Western closes around about 40 stations on the 1st of January 1917. But the small Biddeford, Westwood Ho and Appledore Railway, which only has three stations in Devon, closes all of them in March 1917. The track itself is torn up and is never replaced. The railway never reopens and two of the three locomotives that the company owns are earmarked for service overseas. Unfortunately, the boat that they're on is torpedoed off the Cornwall coast and they're sunk and they were only rediscovered in 2001. Alongside all of these reductions in services, there is also a concerted effort across the British railways to minimise the amount of traffic, the amount of people that are travelling over the railways, cut down on something that they call joyriding, which is people who are travelling for pleasure rather than on business of the national interest. 
On the 1st of January 1917, across the entirety of the British railway network, there is an increase in fares of 50%. The only tickets that are kept out of this increase are season tickets for commuters and workmen's tickets, which are issued to people who are on government business or on business that's identified as being of national interest and of economic benefit. These price increases are then backed up in February 1917 by a speech from Lloyd George in which he implores the travelling public to cut down on these unnecessary journeys because the steel that's saved from these journeys can be pushed into shipbuilding to help counter the submarine menace which starts at the beginning of the year. We have in the Easter week, because holiday season is when most people travel, all advance tickets are cancelled. Nobody is able to buy a ticket between Wednesday the 4th and Monday the 9th of April 1917, except for on the day that they want to travel. And tickets will only be sold up until the capacity of the trains themselves. The weather in that Easter was terrible, and people do stay at home. But this trend doesn't continue. All of the pleas from the government and from the Railway Executive Committee are broadly ignored by passengers. They have money and they want to travel. So by January 1918, all of the railway companies that are under the control of the Executive Committee are reporting that the increases in passengers from January 1917 are in the region of 14 and 43% in different parts of the country. Now, this isn't just people who are travelling for pleasure. There's also a lot of different traffic flows that are happening at this stage. One of the most famous examples of this is Gretna. Before the war, Gretna is a largely insignificant station on the line between Carlisle and Glasgow. It's served by the Caledonian Railway Company. In 1914, there are around about 8,600 passengers that either get on or get off a train at Gretna. But there is a decision taken by the government to establish a colossal munitions factory at Gretna. By 1917, Gretna is employing 17,500 people. There is a new town created at Gretna to house some of these workers. There is also a huge increase in the number of passengers using the station. And in the year 1917, the Caledonian Railway handles almost 3 million passengers through Gretna station, as opposed to the 8,000 that used it before the war. Nobody knows when the war will end, so nobody knows how long the British Railways will need to be able to keep supplying men and materials, both to the forces overseas and also to all of the passenger and traffic flows that are happening in Britain. By November 1918, when the war does come to an end, we find that the railways are not actually in as bad a condition as people would have expected. They're certainly not in as bad a condition as the railways in France and Germany. There is very little damage to the British railway lines as a result of enemy action. A few air raids knock about various parts of the northeastern network up around Hartlepool and Scarborough. And there's also a little bit of damage in London when air raids take place there. But by and large, the British railways escape from the direct effects of the war. Also, what is very helpful to the British railways is that before the war, British railways were incredibly oversupplied in terms of locomotives and wagons and rolling stock. Whereas in places like Germany, in particular, the railways were incredibly efficient. Because all of Britain's railways were privately owned, where there were particularly profitable routes, companies would duplicate or triplicate the lines to give commuters choice. This means there is a sufficiency of reserves of things like locomotives and rolling stock within Britain that certainly doesn't exist in the major belligerents. Around about 20% of Britain's locomotives need to be overhauled at the end of the war. But only around about 3% of the wagons have been dispatched overseas. This means that by the summer of 1919, so just six, seven months after the war has ended, a lot of the amenities that have been withdrawn from the railways during the war, things like dining cars, luggage facilities, have all been restored. And by 1921, when the Railway Executive Committee hands control of the railways back to the companies, the war is largely forgotten. But although the railways have gotten back to what you could call normality, the railway companies don't forget the men who went overseas to fight, of whom around about 21,000 didn't return. 
The railway companies produce some of the more prominent and some of the more poignant memorials to their employees that we see around the country. It's not just the largest companies that participate in this. The Midland Railways in Derby and the North Eastern Railways in York, the memorials were designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, who also designed the Cenotaph in London. Charles Sergeant Jagger, he designed the very famous memorial at Paddington Station to the memory of the men from the Great Western Railway who died during the First World War. And in Salehurst Church down in Kent, there is a bronze memorial plaque on the church wall to the only soldier who dies who was an employee of the Kent and East Sussex Railway. That was Dr Christopher Phillips on the railways. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Hugh Murphy about shipbuilding during the war.